I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's September 3rd, and we have a lot to talk about. About 25 to 30 percent of the people living with MS are Medicare beneficiaries. Most of us know Medicare as health insurance for Americans who are 65 or older. But when they qualify for Social Security disability benefits, people younger than 65 automatically qualify for Medicare. Getting the right Medicare coverage requires making a few important choices. You have to choose between what I'll call classic Medicare and Medicare Advantage. And if you choose classic Medicare... Well, you might also want to consider Medicare supplement coverage. If you qualify for Medicaid, you'll want to carry Medicaid and Medicare. It all adds up to a lot of details that go into making the right Medicare choices, and there are some excellent resources available to help. Today, licensed Medicare advisor Laquell Thomas joins me to explain how you can make the best choices when it comes to your Medicare coverage. And that's useful information if you already have Medicare or if you'll be signing up for Medicare in the future. But before we get to my conversation with Laquell, there are a few other things that you should know about. Pharmaceutical company Sanofi announced some good news with the results of a phase three clinical trial for tolibrutinib, an experimental oral BTK inhibitor. The results showed that compared to placebo, tolibrutinib met the primary endpoint of the trial, delaying the onset of confirmed disability progression in people with non-relapsing secondary progressive MS. So let's break down what all of that means. BTK inhibitors have been shown to be an effective treatment for some forms of cancer, and they represent a new category of MS disease-modifying therapy. And it's a category with some interesting characteristics. Now, the BTK stands for Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is a protein that plays an important role in the development of B cells. A BTK inhibitor blocks the activity of this protein. And what makes this drug particularly important is BTK inhibitors can cross the blood-brain barrier. So they can target B cells in the central nervous system which is something that, as of today, no other DMT can do. Now that we better understand what tolibrutinib is, let's talk about these results of the Phase three clinical trial. As I mentioned a moment ago, the results of the trial showed that tolibrutinib performed better than placebo in delaying the onset of confirmed disability progression in people with non-relapsing secondary progressive MS. If you're a little fuzzy about non-relapsing secondary progressive MS, it's a subtype of MS in which symptoms steadily worsen over time without relapses. So having a medication that slows that disability progression is a potential game changer. Sanofi also announced that in separate phase 3 clinical trials, tolibrutinib was not shown to be superior to Obagio in reducing the annualized relapse rate among people with relapsing remitting MS. So the announcement about tolibrutinib is decidedly mixed, but given that it's the first and only therapy that's been shown to slow the onset of confirmed disability progression in people with non-relapsing secondary progressive MS, I think the good news wins the day. More details on the outcome of the tolibrutinib phase 3 clinical trial are going to be shared in a couple of weeks at Ectrum's, the largest MS research conference in the world. I'll be there, and you'll be hearing directly from the experts involved in these clinical trials. It isn't every day that we get to talk about a movie about someone who's living with MS. But today, we can. The movie Take My Hand is an Australian film that had its U.S. premiere just last week. It's based on the true story of Claire Jens, a mother of three living in London, who's diagnosed with MS at the peak of her high-powered career. Following the loss of her job and the sudden death of her husband, Claire moves back home to Australia, 
where a chance encounter with her high school sweetheart sends her life in a whole new direction. The film was co-written and directed by Claire's former high school sweetheart and real-life husband, John Riftopoulos, and if you're affected by MS, you're going to see some very familiar scenes when you watch this movie. I had a chance to talk with Claire, John, and Rada Mitchell, the actress who plays Claire in the film. In a moment, you'll hear our conversation. The film Take My Hand is based on a true story about a mother of three living in London who, at the peak of her career, is diagnosed with MS. Following the loss of her job and the sudden death of her husband, she moves back to Australia, where a chance encounter with her high school sweetheart sends her life in a new direction. Joining me to talk about what feels like a very personal and certainly a very moving film are Claire Jens, the woman whom the film is based on, her husband, John Reftopoulos, the film's co-writer and director, and Rada Mitchell, the actress who plays Claire in this film. Claire, Rada, John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. First, how are you doing, Claire? I'm doing pretty well. Um, pretty tired, but I'm okay. Um, happy to be here. Had to be representing our film. Well, I appreciate you being part of today's conversation as well. Uh, John, let me ask you, what motivated you to want to tell this story? Um, how much I've been in love with Claire for so long was one of the reasons, but um, look, mainly just to make some noise for MS. Um, we um, started out um, sort of six years ago on this journey, and, I mean, Claire and I just reconnected, and um, and there was so much that had happened in the 20 years that had passed in, in both our lives and, and, and mainly um, re-meeting Claire again and seeing her symptoms and um, the struggles she was having. And I thought, you know, maybe we can do something about this. So we, we took it that step further. Claire, as we see in the film, getting that MS diagnosis and starting to process what it might mean in terms of your future and your well-being is never easy. Losing a high-profile mm-hmm. job with significant responsibility is never easy, and and seeing your MS progress is certainly not easy. What was the experience like for you yeah. to see some of these highly personal and highly emotional moments of your life portrayed by actors on a big screen? It was a very confronting experience, very um, moving, but also very emotional. I cried a lot. Um, and actually, each scene was so real and so it was quite hard to be around. But I did it, and it was um, it was quite um, moving and emotional and very cathartic. Rada, was it challenging for you to portray a character who not only had physical and cognitive challenges, but who experienced these disabilities progress as the story progressed? Yeah, I mean. It- it wasn't benchmarked in the script exactly when things were changing. So that was sort of a bit intuitive, like how are we going to do it? And obviously, you know, John had had a point of view there. Um, but I, I think really what I was really drawn to was the story, the sort of romance of the story, the sort of the healing, the sort of soul healing part of the story. I really feel like as much as uh, the character or Claire was going through what she was going through physically on an emotional and spiritual level, she was healing. And so I was really drawn to that part of the story. How did you prepare for the role? I really just spent time with Claire um, and I did some sort of kind of interesting stuff in LA where I work with a dream coach. So I did some stuff on a sort of that kind of level, dream level. Um, And then Claire and I spent time, we met on Zoom before I came out. John, this is a deeply personal story. What was the most challenging part of the screenplay for you to write? Good question. Um, so I, I think, you know, you, you write a script and you don't really know how it's going to sound until the words come out of the actor's mouth. So we had a, um, a bit of a, a test run um, around four or five months earlier with some other actors and it was good for me to, to see the words come out and, and how to look and we did, did some scenes with horses and I sort of threw myself in the deep end there at how it'll look and 
but I had a strong idea of what I wanted from how the story to come out. Um, then Rada, Rada came on board and, um, you know, as you not only met Claire, we spent a couple of days at our house going through um, what Claire's job was and, and where um, the power that, that she had in that position in her life at that time, Rada had to bring that into those scenes. So, you know, we spent some days going through what Claire actually did for a job. Um, that helped a lot. Um, mm-hmm. And then, but, but some of the challenges were, look, just uh, <laughs> directing a first film, first feature for me. Um, obviously, uh, we had such a great crew and Bronte and everyone did a great job. But, you know, I just, just took it a day at a time. It sounds very simple, but I just worry about the next setup, the next um, the next day of dialogue, the next three or four pages or whatever it might be, um, and just so not, not to get overwhelmed. Um, and I... Uh, and I made it through. So that sort of <laughs> 39 days, like a blur, um, but it all mm. happened very quickly. Um, everything else has um, taken a lot of time, but we've made it to here, so we're pretty proud to get to this point, that's for sure. Well, as you were directing the film, I'm sure you were focused on the actors and the scene you were shooting and the next scene that had to be set up and a million other details that a director is probably thinking about, but you were also watching scenes from your own life or scenes from Claire's life in the years you two were apart. Mm. How was that experience? Mm. How was that experience for you? Uh, yeah, well, it was, you know, Claire was right behind me on the set. So um, I talked to her before the scenes and every, every time I said cut, I'd turn around and look at Claire. Um, most of the time that seemed to go okay. Um, yeah, it was, it was, again, just, just concentrating on, on the next moment. Um, not to think too far ahead. I mean, I'm a, actually, I was thinking ahead, but um, you know, just just what what we did wrong, what we did right. Um, yeah, it was a bit. As I said, to have so many great people around me, it, it made things a lot a lot easier. And um, having a, a great script supervisor and and you know, Wade, the, the DP was is just a fabulous guy. We work well together, and I was just lucky to have everybody around me. And to have Rada Mitchell in front of me, it's even better. Mm-hmm. Well, I think in addition to capturing Claire's story, one of the things that really comes across visually throughout the film is Claire's mm. love of horses. Visually, mm. it, it's it's beautiful to see. Um, I'm, I'm glad you spent some mm. time letting the audience in on that love of horses. I think it was uh, just uh, wonderfully done. Thank you. Yeah. That was nice one of the joys. Ride. I was great playing that role because I wasn't so familiar with horse riding. Uh, but we got to train um, on the weekends, and so when we finally got to shoot that scene, that I think that was one of one of my favorite. It comes that across. Was fun. It comes across that way. Claire, what, yeah. what would you like the audience to be thinking about as they make their way from the theater to the parking lot after seeing the film? One thing I think about with MS is it's quite a difficult disease to have, and I want people to be more hopeful a bit more positive about life because I think it's actually, it's not a gift, but it actually can change life in a good way. You can think about things that are important to you, things that matter to you, and things that are critical to you. So I think that hopefully people will be more present, be more aware of what they can do and can't do. Just awareness for the disease is obviously the main yes. main thing we're trying to, to do here. I think, right. we've done, I think we've done that. Yes. I think you have. The film is called Take yeah. My Hand. Claire Jens, John Reftopoulos, Rada Mitchell, Thank you for sharing an honest portrayal of how MS impacts people and families and how in the midst of it all, we can still find happy endings. Thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll add that you'll find a link to the trailer for Take My Hand in today's show notes. 20 years ago, Dr. David Hafler discovered a specific type of T-cell that suppresses the immune system in humans. These T-cells are called regulatory T-cells, or TREGs. Dr. Hafler's research team later discovered that when these regulatory T-cells are defective, they become an underlying cause of autoimmune disease, specifically multiple sclerosis. What wasn't discovered was the mechanism that causes this dysfunction in regulatory T-cells. That is, until now. A research team at Yale, a team that was led by Dr. Tamakazu Sumido and Dr. Hafler, has found that this loss of immune regulation 
is caused by an increase in a protein involved in the immune function. This protein is called PRDM1S, and an increase in PRDM1S has been shown to trigger an interaction between multiple genetic and environmental factors, including high salt intake. Now, in an earlier study, Doctors Sumita and Hafler found that high levels of salt induced inflammation in a type of immune cell known as a CD4 T cell. It also caused a loss of regulatory T cell function. The researchers discovered that this activity was mediated by a salt-sensitive enzyme known as SGK1, an enzyme that's critical for cell signaling. Now, in this study, the research team compared gene expression in people with MS and people who didn't have MS. And the researchers found that the people with MS showed an increased expression of that PRDM1S protein. They were surprised to also learn that this increase in that protein served to increase the expression of that salt-sensitive enzyme, SGK1. And that increase in SGK1 led to a disruption of regulatory T cells. They also discovered this overexpression of SGK1 in other autoimmune diseases, suggesting that it may be a common feature of regulatory T cell dysfunction. Based on their discoveries, the research team is collaborating with other researchers to develop drugs that can target and decrease expression of this PRDM1S protein in regulatory T cells. Now, if they're successful in their efforts, these new drugs could stop the autoimmune response before it starts, and that would have a major impact in stopping MS. There's much more work to be done here, and we'll be sure to keep you informed about this promising effort as new information becomes available. Meanwhile, if you'd like to review the details of this research, you'll find a link in today's show notes. Many experts define MS as a disease that's purely driven by immune system dysfunction. But newly published results of a stem cell study demonstrate that MS may also be fueled by processes originating within the brain itself. In this study, researchers took blood or skin cells from six people with relapsing remitting MS, five people with primary progressive MS, six people with secondary progressive MS, and five healthy people. These cells were reprogrammed back into a stem cell-like state, from which the investigators derived what are referred to as induced pluripotent stem cells, stem cells that can mature into almost any type of human cell. These induced pluripotent stem cells were developed into cultures of glial cells. Glial cells mostly support the function of nerve cells. And keep in mind, these cell cultures were grown in the lab, not inside the body, which means a research team could observe the behavior of these cells when they weren't being influenced by the presence of immune cells or inflammatory signals the researchers found that the glial cells that were derived from people with primary progressive MS generated fewer oligodendrocytes, and oligodendrocytes are the cells that produce myelin. The results of this study showed that these glial cells themselves could play an important role in MS disease progression and development, creating a new understanding of MS progression while identifying a new therapeutic target. If you'd like to review the details of this study, I'll warn you that it may be a heavy lift, but you'll find that link in today's show notes. It's not unusual for researchers and clinicians to measure health-related quality of life among people with MS who are living with some level of physical disability. But what about those people with MS who are experiencing very mild disability? While many people with MS don't experience significant functional limitations early in the disease course, their quality of life may still be affected by the psychological weight of being diagnosed with a chronic condition for which there is no cure. A research team in Italy explored this question by designing a study that would assess clinical 
and psychological aspects of MS that impact people who are living with MS, who are also fully ambulatory. And after measuring overall health, physical disability, and cognitive disability among people with MS, they compared those measures to measures with the general population of Italy. And the researchers found that people with mild MS did not perceive their physical quality of life very differently from the general population. However, they viewed their mental quality of life as significantly worse. In fully ambulatory people with MS, mood, psychosomatic symptoms, fatigue, and age each influence their physical quality of life. Lower mental quality of life was associated with psychosomatic symptoms, older age, fatigue, and anxiety. This association with anxiety was especially pronounced in the years directly following diagnosis. This study serves as an example of what may be considered one of the shortcomings in the EDSS. That's the Expanded Disability Status Scale that's used to characterize the level of disability in multiple sclerosis. The EDSS is largely weighted toward physical symptoms. For example, how fast you can complete a 25-foot walk. And by failing to adequately take into consideration real but invisible symptoms like cognitive dysfunction, fatigue, and anxiety, an EDSS score can fall short of representing a patient's actual health status and well-being. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes. With 25 to 30 percent of the people with MS relying on Medicare for their health insurance, making the right choices in selecting your Medicare coverage goes a long way to ensuring your quality of life and your overall well-being. In a moment, my guest Laquel Thomas walks us through some of the things to keep in mind when it comes to your Medicare coverage. With somewhere between a quarter and a third of all the people with MS relying on Medicare for their health insurance, it's important to understand the ins, outs, and details of this national health insurance program that provides coverage for people over the age of 65, as well as many people under the age of 65 who are living with disabilities. Laquell Thomas is joining me to help answer the kinds of questions that you might have if you're contemplating Medicare coverage in the future or if you have Medicare coverage today. Laquell is a licensed insurance consultant who, through the National MS Society's Medicare Advisor Service, helps people affected by MS make informed decisions about their health insurance coverage. Welcome to the podcast, Laquell. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Medicare has several different parts, and it comes in a couple of different flavors. So, I'm hoping you'll start us off by explaining what Medicare Part A, B, and D are, and we're going to circle back to Part C in just a minute. Okay, thanks. Um, Great question. Um, Medicare Part A is considered to be hospital insurance. It covers inpatient hospital stays. Part B is the medical insurance. It covers any outpatient um, labs, um, outpatient. MRIs, any type of outpatient services, physician services that you may have. Part D is for drugs. That's the prescription drug plan um, that is offered by private insurance companies. The Medicare Part D is for drugs. I said we'd be getting back to Medicare Part C, and Medicare Part C is more commonly known as Medicare Advantage. So can you help us understand the difference between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage? Yes. Original Medicare, again, consists of only the two parts, Medicare Part A for hospital, Medicare Part B, which is the medical insurance. Um, The difference with Part C is it combines all the parts of Medicare, um, the Part A, the Part B, and the Part D. So that's why they call it Part C. Um, And the Part C plans are offered by private insurance companies um, that have an agreement with Medicare to offer these plans to Medicare recipients. If you're living with MS, there are some things that immediately come to mind when you're evaluating any health insurance plan. 
So does Medicare cover MRI exams, physical and occupational therapy, and durable medical equipment? Yes. um, Medicare covers all the services that you may need. Again, as long as they meet the the medical coverage guidelines and um, the doctor submits all the documentation that's required, Medicare covers, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. They cover physicians, specialty visits, MRIs. So they cover all the same benefits that you've had, you know, throughout whatever plans you had previously. It's just, it's just, different, a different type of coverage. But yes, they do cover the same um, benefits that you, you've always um, had. What about coverage for MS disease modifying therapies? Yes, they do cover the MS disease modifying therapies. Again, as long as they meet the medical coverage guidelines and a doctor submits the um, medical criteria that's needed to support it, then yes, they will cover that. An MS care team is made up of several different healthcare providers. For instance, a care team might include a primary care physician, a neurologist, and a physical therapist, or maybe an occupational therapist. If someone is hoping to continue seeing the same doctors that they had before Medicare, should they be thinking about original Medicare or Medicare Advantage, or does that even matter? It, it does matter because certain doctors, it depends on their doctors. Not all doctors accept Medicare. Not all doctors accept Medicare Advantage. So w- what I would do is, in my case, when I have a client, I do an assessment. I go through all of their doctors, all of their medications, and I try to compare to see if their doctors, which plans the doctor accepts and if the doctor does accept original Medicare. But they can keep in mind that they would be able to see most of their same doctors um, for the most part. You know, Medicare, like almost any other insurance coverage, includes some out-of-pocket costs as well. And if someone is hoping to limit their out-of-pocket expense for their disease-modifying therapy, will choosing Original Medicare or Medicare Advantage make a difference? Yes. um, Original Medicare doesn't really have an out-of-pocket cap. So if you um, decide to stay with Original Medicare, whatever you're paying, you're not really getting credit towards your out-of-pocket expenses. And um, with the Medicare Advantage plan, you do. There is a cap on what your out-of-pocket expenses would be. So there is a maximum out-of-pocket limit that they do have for the plan year. So for the most part, if you reach that limit anytime during the year, if you have a Medicare Advantage, you're covered at 100%. You generally don't have any other out-of-pocket costs. But if you stay with regular traditional Medicare, then you're just going to continue to pay whatever co-insurance since or out-of-pocket expenses you have. Um, regardless of how much you spent during during the year. Some people with MS may have other health-related conditions. I'm wondering whether Original Medicare or Medicare Advantage covers things like dental, vision, or hearing benefits. Original Medicare doesn't cover those benefits, um, only if it's related to a medical condition. But the Medicare Advantage plans, they do include supplemental benefits, such as the dental, the vision, and the hearing benefits. Can you tell us what Medigap insurance coverage is and whether people living with MS can qualify for Medigap coverage? Medigap, which is also known as Medicare Supplement, those are plans that, again, are sold by private insurance companies. They supplement what regular Medicare covers. Um, Generally, um, there's several different um, Medicare Medigap policies, um, depending on which plan you choose, um, determines what your coverage or what your out-of-pocket expenses might be. There is an additional monthly premium that you have to pay with the Medigap policy, depending on your age, that can be expensive. Um, if you're someone on, you know, that has MS and that you were found disabled and you're not 65 yet, the premium can be quite expensive, but they do have options. Again, um, if you're someone that was just newly eligible for Medicare and you want to get a Medigap policy, there's a six month guaranteed issue where you can you know, be accepted regardless of your medical condition. Um, If you happen to enroll after that time frame, there are certain criteria that has to be met um, for you to be accepted 
into the Medigap policy, but um, MS patients, they do have options and they can go with a Medigap policy. But again, it, it depends on your financial situation because there is an additional monthly cost to the Medigap policy. How does it work if someone with MS is covered by their spouse's job-related health insurance and they become eligible for Medicare? It can kind of affect their job-based insurance. Um, it depends on the group size of the employer. So what I recommend, I tell my clients to talk to the benefit administrator, see what the options would be now that they're eligible for Medicare, if it's in their best interest to stay on the job-based plan or to go with Medicare um, enroll in Medicare. But if they happen to choose to opt out of Medicare Part B, they will, you know, there's a myth that you may be penalized. You won't be penalized depending on if you have other coverage during that time frame. Once you're, you know, eligible for Medicare or if you happen to lose your job based coverage, you can always re enroll back in Medicare, but you're not necessarily having to go with Medicare if you're if you have coverage under a job based plan. Some people with MS may require home health care or even care at a skilled nursing facility. Does Medicare cover that sort of long-term care? Medicare covers a skilled nursing facility um, services if you've you know, been discharged and you need rehab. So if it's something re related to medical needs, they will cover that, but they would not cover any type of long-term care as far as a custodial care, home health, um, things with daily live activities of daily living. Traditional Medicare does not cover those um, services. There are some Medicare Advantage plans that include limited um, benefits as far as, you know, needing some type of home health aid, but it is very limited. Um, what I recommend, if, you know, to explore long-term care plans because those are the plans that gives you more coverage for custodial care, home health care, um, adult day care, system living facilities. But again, the cost is, is kind of expensive depending on your circumstances. Can someone have both Medicare and Medicaid? Yes, um, you can have both. Um, if you have both Medicare and Medicaid, you're considered to be dual eligible. Though there are special plans available for recipients that have both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, it helps you um, helps individuals that have very low income get assistance as far as with the medical costs and also provides extra help for their prescription drugs. I think our conversation makes the point that there are a lot of details to consider when it comes to making an informed decision about Medicare coverage. How can someone get help in making the best decision for themselves? They can visit the National MS Society, um, the resource page, um, find a navigator. Um, they can also visit Medicare.gov. They also can um, connect with the trusted Medicare advisor, someone as myself that's licensed, that understand the different plans and the different options and, you know, try to do their own due diligence as far as research to make sure they have the best plan to suit their needs. Well, Laquell Thomas, I want to thank you for all you do to ensure that the best choices get made when it comes to Medicare coverage for someone living with MS. And thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you for having me today, John. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 366. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll pay a visit to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices. <laughs>